Welcome to the fifth lecture in Riparian Function and Management. In our last meeting, we continued discussing some common riparian language. You were introduced to watershed versus water catchment, reach classification, lintic and lotic systems, flow classification, potential and capability, USGS topo map clues, flow origin, and sediment transport and bed load. Your homework assignment was to choose a creek for observations and find the site on a USGS topo map. A good site will be convenient to visit and visible. It will have perennial flow and have a USGS gauge nearby. In this lesson, we will examine riparian recovery and the processes that guide the natural recovery process. We will also consider conditions that may have led to a degraded or dysfunctional condition and issues that could be hindering riparian recovery. Pictured here is a site on Burrow Creek, which lies on BLM land in the Texas mountains of Arizona. The first image was taken in 1981. The creek at this site was still perennial, but flows had reduced to a trickle running between pools. No riparian function was visible from this photo point. Water was not being stored in the banks. There was no sponge. So fast forward 19 years to 2000. The site is now clearly functional and storing water. It has a riparian sponge. So what changed? How did this happen? Hold those questions in mind and let's look at the processes that led to this remarkable recovery. If you will recall, our definition of functioning condition involves having enough stuff, vegetation, landform, and large woody material to first and foremost dissipate stream energy. Then and only then do we begin to have stable banks, reduced erosion, sediment trapping, enlarged floodplains, stored water, flood water retention, and groundwater re recharge, and sustained base flow. So, it is physical function that produces the values that we appreciate and demand from the creeks and the rivers. This is the key concept. Physical function leads to values. In preparation for discussing riparian recovery, let's review the parts of a stream and some of the processes that are occurring there. You'll recall the channel which is confined by the banks, the floodplain which is composed of sediments, the normal base flow where the fish live, flood flows, flooding is an important and essential component of the creek and river system, the water table is a part of the creek, the vegetation, the large woody material which could include fallen or dead trees, and all of the other organic litter and debris. Then, the, the processes and dynamics that occur and involve these parts, mostly during floods, include erosion and deposition of sediments, bankful discharge, which is the level of flow that does most of the work of channel formation, there's sinuosity, the crookedness, and an important energy dissipation scheme, the width to depth ratio, the measurement that can quantify channel conditions, the gradient, the slope of the channel, a measure of steepness, which is calculated by the change in elevation over the length of the channel. Recruitment, which is the process of inviting new plants to establish and survive, survival being the key to recruitment. Root density, which we can see the vegetation above ground, but imagine what we can't see, which is the mass of roots and buried debris that hold the banks in place. Channel stability is the vertical and horizontal stability, and both are important. Too much energy and not enough energy dissipation leads to instability. And plant succession, the process of change in the species structure of the plant community over time. In the riparian area, the group of plants that colonize fresh sediment may not be the same plants that end up stabilizing the area. Let's see how these processes interact. We will examine how dysfunction happens and how the natural processes can work together to heal a degraded and dysfunctional riparian area. Here is the Blanco Creek, a small creek on the Edwards Plateau in the hill country. The pasture that the creek runs through has been grazed for more than 100 years on a mostly continuous basis. 
riparian areas are favored by livestock and without careful management, will soon experience disproportionate pressure within a pasture. This creek has been scoured by successive floods. It has lost most of its riparian soils, and the channel has cut down to the bedrock and then wider and wider to accommodate flood waters. It is now overly wide and excessively shallow, and an unhealthy width to depth to ratio, unhealthy width to depth ratio exists. The channel and banks are lacking in energy, dissipating vegetation, are lacking in energy dissipating vegetation to slow flood water and trap sediments. Unfortunately, so many streams do look like this one that has become a norm. It is the way we expect hill country creeks to look. Let's see how this hill country creek channel might work in its function, functional condition. We will be relying on terms that we learned in lessons two and three and the dynamic processes outlined previously. Many hill country creek beds have built themselves on a top on top of a layer of limestone rock. Blanco Creek is a perennial stream. It has a base flow. Then, after some rains, the channel fills up and reaches a bank full level. Once the bank is overtopped, flood water spills out onto the floodplain. Flood flows contribute, wa to, contribute water to the water table, which if supported by a healthy function riparian area, will create a sponge-like condition. This riparian sponge water table then supports the base flow to the creek during drier times. The channel is stable, held in place by dense roots and buried logs. Unlike the one on the Blanco Creek, it has a healthy width to depth ratio and the channel would be crooked. It would be appropriately sinuous as the gradient flow and bed load supports. When the vegetation along the creek has been removed continuously and its recovery hindered by constant grazing, the root density dwindles. No new plants are allowed to grow. Plant secession is inhibited, as was the case on the Blanco Creek. There is not enough energy dissipation to slow the water down on the floodplain, and the banks begin to wash away and erode. This leads to a wider and wider channel. One way a creek accommodates undissipated flood energy is by mining more and more material from the banks until very little of the sponge or water table is left to the base flow. Now we can visualize what is missing from the riparian area in this photo on the Blanco Creek. In its current dysfunctional condition, Blanco Creek is missing its water storage capacity. The sponge has been eroded away. The channel has become overwide. The amount of water once represented bank, bank full no longer fills the channel, and the volume that once spilled over the bank and spread into the floodplain does not. It now takes a very large flood to get out of the channel, and when it comes, there's not sufficient energy dissipating vegetation, landform, or large woody material to slow it down. This overly wide channel cannot efficiently carry sediments as they begin to pile up in odd places. Its width to depth ratio is out of whack as it lacks sinuosity and channel stability. Removing the hindrances to recovery, in this case grazing animals, and you can fence them off of a riparian area temporarily resting the whole pasture, is the first step toward initiating riparian recovery. Once the hindrance is removed and the first vegeta vegetation is allowed to grow, natural recovery can be remarkably quick. Recovery benefits from the dynamic process of flooding. Provided that the initial vegetation is allowed to grow, which may only be weeds or early stage colonizers. When flood waters come, the colonizers slow the water down and allow sediments to drop out. Debris from upstream, limbs, root wads of fallen trees, leaves, and even tiny bits of organic matter, matter all can be captured. The 
New plants are recruited to join other colonizers, others colonizing fresh sediments. These may not be favorite plants, but their survival is vital to plant secession. Before long, once conditions have improved, the bigger, strong, stabilizing riparian plants begin to emerge. As the plants mature, so do their dense root systems, working to support channel formation. As the stream incorporates more and more debris and trapped sediments, the channel width decreases and the depth in the gradient will adjust. Pretty soon, the narrowing channel has begun to meander, developing sinuosity. This new sinuosity also aids in dissipating stream energy. A once dysfunctional riparian area like the Blanco Creek, like Blanco Creek recovered naturally once the hindrance to the process was addressed. Plants were allowed to grow by removing the grazing pressure, and in a relatively short period of time of five to seven years, a remarkable recovery has taken place. The riparian area now has adequate vegetation, landform, and large woody material to stabilize banks, reduce erosion, trap sediment, build floodplain, store water, retain flood water, recharge groundwater, and sustain base flow, all the components of physical condition function. The channel is clearly defined and held above a bedrock by plant roots. Now at Bank Fool, the water spills out over a well-vegetated floodplain and recharges the water table, which acts like a sponge in feeding the base flow during dry times. With these terms and processes in mind, we can now examine a documented riparian recovery. On the USGS topo map, Burrow Creek at this location is shown as a small perennial stream or solid blue line. The site is located on federal land, a Bureau of Land Management or BLM grazing allotment. In 1981 when this photo was taken, the BLM manager and the rancher or lessee realized that the Burrow Creek had become dysfunctional and that something was hindering its recovery. They talked and walked the creek and invited others to collaborate about it. It was identified the wild burrow grazing was hindering the riparian recovery. In 1983, the allotment management plan, or AMP, for the burrow creek was changed. The plan prescribed a 92% reduction of the wild burrow population. It also included a four-year deferment in all livestock grazing, followed by a seasonal rotation plan with back-to-back -back seasonal rest periods. Once the first plants were allowed to grow without grazing pressure, early succession colonizers like burrow bush and other plants began to dissipate energy from flood waters and trap and stabilize tiny bits of organic matter and fine sediments. Those sediments provided the seed material for highly stabilizing riparian plants. By 2000, the natural riparian recovery was remarkable. Sustained base flow, stabilized banks, and reduced erosion produced an abundance of forage for livestock and a healthy fish population. Another remarkable recover story was documented on Nevada's Beaver Creek. The west fork of Beaver Creek at this location is shown on USGS topo maps as a small perennial stream. See the solid blue line. However, in 1985, it had become almost seasonal in its flow regime. The continuous grazing of cattle and sheep was identified as a hindrance. Management changes were made and recovery began to occur. By 1988, lots of colonizer plants, though not necessarily preferable ones, had taken hold. Ten years later, the creek was storing water like a sponge and its perennial flow had returned. Another recovery story was documented near Elko, Nevada on BLM land. Dixie Creek had developed into a less than perennial creek and was becoming an unreliable water supply. The creek was fenced into a special riparian pasture and briefly excluded from the grazing program. Once recovery had occurred, it then was managed with preferential seasonal grazing. 
Most remarkable recover story, recovery stories begin with at least a short grazing exclusion. The Susie Creek story here is based entirely on seasonal and livestock type changes. While recovery was still remarkable, it may have taken a bit longer than other examples. It was badly downcut. Recovery required that a new channel evolve at a lower elevation. Susie Creek was grazed until 1991 with annual hot season use by cow and calf pairs, which then went to a spring and fall program with reduced numbers. By 1999, willow trees, a high succession stabilizing plant, were established, and by 2000, beaver occupied the reach. The 2000, 2012 recovery image was slightly different from a from a slightly different angle shows a channel in transition with cattails and a wet meadow and marsh developing. When the channel is sitting at its original elevation on the landscape, the water table is also at that level. Just as we have seen before, the base flow is connected to the water table. And when water and when flood waters are able to spread out and soak in, they contribute to the recharge of the water table. In many creeks, there are no confining rock layers under the creek's beds, like we saw in the Blanco Creek recovery example. Without a barrier and a functional riparian area, stream channels can cut down, down, and down before going wide. They will cut wider still until the channel size matches the energy being delivered. Incised channels drain water from the landscape. They do this instead of contributing to the water table. The water table drains into the channel. I'm going to reread this slide. Incised channels drain water from the landscape. Instead of contributing to the water table, the water table drains into the channel. The more a channel is downcut or incised into a valley, the more difficult it is for the creek to access its floodplain. The bankful volume of water, which once sat at this elevation, in a downcut channel, is now at a lower elevation. Like Blanco Creek, Suzy Creek has recovered its function. However, without a confining layer, it will take geologic time to recover its elevation into the landscape. Visualize this. Before downcutting, the channel probably sat high on the landscape. It kept keeping the valley wet like a half-rung sponge. Now the downcut channel drains the adjacent landscape. Camp Creek in Oregon at this site is shown on the topo map as a perennial stream reference the solid blue line. Camp Creek in Central Oregon developed as a gulf, gully in the late 1800s due to overgrazing of a wet meadow. This first photo was taken on May of 1989, and in 2004, though the site remains at a lower elevation than it, wa than it was in the 1800s, the bottom of the channel was two to three feet higher than in 1989. Those three feet of trapped sediment represent added water holding capacity and they are clearly storing water just as a sponge would. Camp Creek located in Central Oregon was badly incised. The creek was actually created by dysfunction. It developed in the 1800s when a wet meadow was chronically stripped by grazing and a channel was eroded by water moving across the landscape due to lack of energy dissipation. The exclusion of livestock managed by the BLM led to the buildup of the stream bed, which con continues to date. 
top left photos were taken in 1989, lower right photos taken in 2004. Channel bed aggradation in the past 15 years is estimated to, about, to be about 2 to 3 feet. Another remarkable recovery process documents Texas Creek, Colorado. In 1976, Texas Creek's riparian wetland area was non-functional, failing to provide adequate vegetation, landform, or woody debris to dissipate stream energies associated with high flows. With storm events, the stream channel migrated, erosion accelerated, sediment was unfiltered, flood water retention and groundwater recharge were limited, and water quality was altered. In 1978, quality of habitat in Texas Creek had started to function physically and improve immediately after changing management practices like fencing and deferring seasonal grazing. With increased vegetation, stream energies were reduced, sediment was filtered and captured, stream banks developed, flood water retention and groundwater recharge increased, stream width decreased, erosion was reduced, and water quality improved. By the end of 1978, Texas Creek's vegetation was in proper functioning condition. As you can see here, the riparian vegetation is seen in an early seral state. Last, the vegetation is seen here in its late seral state in a fully proper functioning condition. Today's lesson covered riparian recovery and the processes that guide the natural recovery process. For homework, research your creek site, gathering all available data. Look for personal accounts like historic photos, aerial photos, USGS information about the catchment, slope of the valley, past land uses, etc. Create a date log of all information you find and be prepared to submit the log and discuss your findings. How would you classify the flow at your site? Perennial, seasonal, interrupted, or ephemeral? How would you classify the reach? Sediment generation, transport, or deposition? If possible, take a photo from a vantage point that should, should remain visible over time.